Kristen, welcome. Hello. Hi, so glad to we, be here. We are sitting here. It is, and I don't know when this will exactly be released, but you are shelter in place, right? I am in Los Angeles. And getting to know the finest corners of your apartment, I imagine. Yeah, finest corners of my apartment and the finest corners of the inside of my mind. Yeah, oh, that you know, we've done some episodes on psychedelics before, so I'm not sure we're going there today, but we can uh, <laughs> certainly go there if you choose. But it's part of my shelter in place. If you need there you to go. Know, part of my shelter in place. There you <laughs> go. Excellent. So uh, let's go back because you and I had coffee a couple of months back in Los Angeles. I can't remember the name of the cafe, but we had this great conversation outside as one does in Los Angeles because the weather's always gorgeous. Um, I just want to hear some of this, this recant the story for me of what it's like working in, you had, you were in, was it out the alcohol industry or are you yeah, just like, like you're you working spirits, business. spirits. Okay. So you're in the spirits business and you had some crazy ass stories about, uh, working with gen, some people that I would loosely use this term job for. What was that like? Um, it was interesting. I, I, so I spent 18 years in the alcohol industry, um, sort of in parallel to all the passions I had around fitness and yoga and biohacking and all of that as those things came to the, to the forefront. But the interesting thing about starting in a corporate America and that world, which you have some familiarity with, mm -hmm. was that I was walking in in a time and an era where there were really not a lot of women working in the spirits industry. Um, maybe you'd have someone in the office or headquarters or in the PR team, but you didn't have women in the field. And so it felt really challenging to rock up to my first company meeting and have my boss bring me into my first region I worked in. I think I told you this was like 18 men and me. And the very first day of that job, I, my boss, we had a big meeting. My boss brought me up to the front of the room and said, hello, everybody. I just, we want to welcome Kristen and I want all of you to, to remember one thing, Kristen's a girl. And I think his intention was to like integrate me in the group. He said, Kristen's a girl and I want us to remember we need to be on our best behavior now that we have a woman in the division. And, you know, I want you to watch your mouth and I want you to, you know, just treat her like you would, you know, your sister. He was from Long Island, right? So it was very like Joey Butterfugo, your sister, treat her like your sister. But Like straight out of the Sopranos a, kind of thing? Yeah, sort of. And so, what it really did instead of making it me feel included is it had me immediately separate, right? From this group of guys, as opposed to just kind of letting it roll. And I, I, I learned a lot in that job. I really had to sort of fight for my space and I had to learn very quickly what it was like to get, um, you know, your wrist slapped or, you know, if you did something wrong at work, um, um, the way men communicated with me made me feel like, oh, I would go home and be like, oh, my boss is so mad at me. And rea the reality was some days they'd be like, okay, it's six o'clock. Let's all meet at the bar for a beer. And, and it, it just didn't, ju you know, as a woman, young woman in the industry, I, I didn't know how to put two and two together because women don't communicate in that way. Mm -hmm. And so I learned very quickly how to sort of like separate and put things in their own boxes and say, okay, if I'm getting, if I'm getting praised for one thing or in trouble for something else or learning, you know, having a challenge that I have to learn from, then it doesn't necessarily, the two aren't correlated, but there were definitely instances and I don't, I'm not sure which ones I mentioned to you where I really had to sort of fight for my own mind share and put my foot down and talk to regional directors. And it was a whole different era. <laughs> there was no hashtag me too. There was no, um, you know, just like women were treated very differently. And it was like of no, it was more of a societal norm, I think. And that industry wasn't seeing females. So that was used to being a boys club. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, and I think you probably had that in finance a bit too, in the early years, like lots of guys around making, having just a good, a good old time. Yeah. There's certainly quite a lot of that, even right up until I left. Although it, there was a definitive move towards diversity, which sadly like they had to assign a label to it and say like rah rah and it should never be that way. Like it should just be naturally the way that things things are. But let's uh let's talk about boys clubs because you know somewhat 
another boys club out there somewhat in terms of just headline people is, is this funny world that is biohacking, right? And <laughs> I say that as, as a man, but <laughs> how did you trans transition from spirits world into uh, the health world, you know, because it doesn't, the two are, I can see where you come from, from like the work hard, play hard culture. I get that. Uh, yeah. But also the two are kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum on that health continuum. Like what made you make the jump over? Well, I think I was, I was, like I said, I was doing parallel. I was like paralleling everything in my life. You know, I grew up relatively, I was a tomboy, but I, within that, I was also a ballerina and I was dancing and I was into theater and I was into figuring out what the yoga thing was about as I got into my younger, young teen years and through the university. And so I always had this interest in like physical fitness in various different ways and ways that I could shape, shift my body. And, you know, some of that comes from wanting to look better and, and growing up and developing through your teenage years, which are so awkward. And then a lot of it came from how I felt, you know, I could, I distinctively knew the differences in energy that I was getting when I was doing fitness. But all of that was like, that's like the passion project, you know, into my early 20s, while I was like working to put food on the table, right, in, in a different, in a different career, which someone sort of found me in, in a bartending gig when I was in theater school and said, hey, come and stop bartending and come and work in the spirits industry. You'd be great at this. You're a good, you seem like a good salesperson. I was doing some interesting marketing stuff for Grolsch at the time, wow. believe it or not. So anyway, it, coming from that place of corporate America spirit, I think the thing that I learned the most, like just a little to go back to this like female male thing is like I, I learned and it really parallels to what's happening with the biohacking. I call them the, the biohacking brethren. And yeah. I mean that with so much love because it's, it's like, like it's a, a club. Yeah. 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 And, um, but I think that there was a, a strong parallel because I was in corporate America. I was in the spirits world. I went through two or three different jobs. I, I launched Red Bull in the United States, which was also like a turning point where I said, wait a second, I want to look more into ingredients. I want to look more into what, because now maybe we don't look at Red Bull as like a health product, but it was a functional beverage back then when it first came to the States, like functional beverage. What does that category mean? Right. They developed it. Mm. And all throughout those years, I had had really, really big highs at, with, with amazing players in the game, lots of whom or most of, I want to say probably all of whom were men. And so I either had really great bosses or really shit bosses, Yeah. right? And so I was learning from those two different kinds of people, either learning, wow, this is the way that I really am brought into the fold and treated with respect, or this is the way that I never, if I ever become a manager, which I did later on down the road, I never want to treat people like I'm being treated now. And so I had those two camps, if you will, right? I, I, I love and have learned so much from so many men in my life. And like, just like people in general, right? You're going to get the good and the bad. So mm -hmm. when I, and then also I will say too, that it gave me a really interesting twist when I first started managing because I, I immediately could manage men really well because I knew, yeah. I knew the game, I knew the communication, I knew how to kind of throw down, if you will, or just you know, I knew what they wanted and I could sort of shift my style for that. And when I first started managing women, because of course I wanted to, to you know, you have women to manage too. And I always wanted to like raise women up in the industry because there were still very few. The women would come to me during their reviews or they would take me aside and say, hey, do you like me? And I always thought in the early years, it was a big lesson because it was like, you have to shift your style for women and go back to the communication that you kind of wanted in the beginning and be nimble enough to do both. And so that was a fascinating piece. And what, what it, it taught me a lot about how to translate messages from sort of one side of the fence to the other. And later on, that translated into me translating messages from corporate America, the office, like the, the, the HQ office where all the marketers and salespeople are coming up with these big plans and then being out in the field. So it was like 50% in the office and then 50% in the field and go out to the field and, and say, okay, these are the plans. How do we need to adjust them to make them actually work in, in the day to day? Right. Oh, and so yeah. that, that all of that experience, albeit men, women, or that translation has shifted me over. I, I eventually left 
corporate America opened a fitness studio, which sounds like a crazy pivot, but I really wanted to see what it was like in the eyes of someone who was like running a small business. Um, because I could take my marketing expertise and apply that. So I opened a studio and then I started helping studio owners run the marketing for their businesses. And that wow. led to a whole slew of things where I started speaking at events like mind body of software events to talk about software and plugging in and creating analytics and backend marketing stuff and all the cuteness for marketing and campaigns and branding. But cut to now, eventually I, I shifted my focus to what I've been doing now because I have 15 plus years of all of this health and wellness stuff. And I get to translate just like I did in corporate America, all of these details of the biohacking world, health and fitness, and that I get nerdy about. And I help translate them specifically for me to women, because I want more women to come into the fold. And mm -hmm. when I look at my biohacking experience, and I look at all the people that reared me in this, I look back to the people who started a lot of it, right? It was like, for me, the first, my first love was Mark Sisson, yeah. you know, my first love in that, in that health and fitness piece that seemed like this is outside of the box, right? <laughs> Much like when Dietrich, this guy Dietrich bought Red Bull to the United States, everyone was like, what is this three, this is like an eight ounce, $3 can of soda? I'm so confused. And it was like, it was groundbreaking. And so I looked at Mark Sisson in a, you know, with his, with his whole Mark's Daily Apple and everything he was doing with this primal movement. Um, I was in New York at the time and John Durant was keeping like a meat locker or meat freezer in his house and they had written him up in the New York Times or something and I was like, what is going on in this community? I need to dig in. Mm -hmm. So so there were all these these guys in the early days of my health and fitness and wellness that I was really following and learning from. And that's sort of like how, what got the teaser for me to get into the whole world of biohacking. I was following Dave Asprey shortly thereafter when Bulletproof Proof Coffee first came out, right? Because that's yeah. his hook in many, in many occasions and his books and stuff like that. But that fascination was in me already because at 18, I was like reading the diamond, there's a husband and wife, the, Di the diamond, Mr. and Mrs. Diamond, I don't remember their last name, it wrote a book about um, fit for life that was about mm -hmm. food combining. Mm -hmm. and whether you, you subscribe to that or not, and it's been debunked by now or who knows, but like it was about food combining. And then I was like, oh, this is interesting how your stomach acid, who knows how I was so interested, but I was like nerding out, like how your stomach acid responds to food. And then I got, I bought a juicer. So like I'm 21 years old, I'm buying a juicer. This is an era when people were like, what are you doing? Like this yeah. is the weirdest thing ever. So I'm bringing, this is, Pre bulletproof, pre everything. I'm ha juicing at my grandmother's house, like driving my car with my juicer in it, having juice, food combining, trying vegetarianism. All of the stuff is just fascinating. So, so it made sense that along the way of all my, let's just call it, you know, off the wall eating, but it was just trying different styles of yeah. eating that I fell into the Marks and the Daves. And um, I was lucky enough to be dating a guy at the time that was really into that as well. So when you're when you get to the place where you have a partner and you want to try something together, it makes it really easy, right? It does. If you have the same sort of taste and, and style of, of eating that you want to, like eating lifestyle you want to try. Mm -hmm. So let, let's dive into something that I admittedly have not gone that far into in the show. And this is something that I told you I wanted to explore with you in particular, but um, when it comes to women's nutrition when it comes to uh, that includes food supplements etc but in terms of lifestyle there are some things to be considered other than you know women are just more complicated men from a science perspective which that that is a quote from a scientist who was criticizing the fact that uh, women get less used in studies because of what is effectively the cycle right and so i would love to dive a little bit more into the cycle and how we can strategically use that. Um, we be, how can women can strategically use that to perform better. So I would love to just talk about you, you and I were just chatting about working out and how to manage that within your cycle. Can we talk a little bit more about how to do that? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's really, it's a, it's a, it's a soapbox I'm on lately because 
about a year ago, I started looking at the studies and was turned on to by a nutrition mentor that I have and thought, who, who is, thank goodness, a man who was doing the research because nobody, man, woman, my OBGYN, no one was talking to me about the yeah. studies. And if someone had told me when I was 20, I would have adhered differently to programming. So optimization for women is um, based around your period, your cycle, menstruation, whatever you want to call it, is there are incredible gains to be made. And I think still we're not talking enough about them. And people ask me why. And part of it, like, yeah, there's not a lot as much. It's more and more now, right? The scientific research. But I think also there's something about like women's sexual health or getting your period or whatever that people are like, we just don't want to talk about that or there's shame around that or whether it's cultural, cultural or social or whatever. But I press with my clients that are cycling. So they're, you know, of the age where they're still getting their period, I press them to follow a prescription or a protocol of um, the first two weeks of your cycle, you have an estrogen bump. So if you call day one, your first day of your period, by day two or three, like, let's also say this disclaimer, everybody's physiology is different. Of course. Men and women have their, everyone has their own specific physiology and their own needs and their own, you know, okays from their doctor. But if we're talking about a general, relatively healthy female with a cycle, then the first two weeks of your cycle, you have the capability via the estrogen in your system, because you have a spike from about day two or three of your period to uh, day 12 or 14, to during your cycle to have extra estrogen and that big that that bell curve of estrogen in your system gives you the capability to build 44 percent more muscle than the back half of your cycle seems like that's insane that seems like the ultimate training chief like every olympic athlete or any that that's that data has to be around from like way back when, you know, like the Russians or had that or do you know when that data? Was? The Russian gymnast. It was <laughs> a Russian gymnast. But they didn't tell anyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, no. It's from, it was like 1983. The great thing is like, yeah, this is like, the, there's hundreds of studies from the eighties. Nobody told me about them or we're talk. nobody was really talking about them in well, a big way. In certain kids, like think, in workouts, like in some of the best studies come out of the USSR, right? And this, you don't get a lot of access to that. Yeah. I mean, if anyone wants to nerd out, just so you know, it's like the, the two big studies are this one, Sung et al., 2014. Uh, that's like 20 women training one leg against another, first two mm-hmm. weeks, back two weeks. And um, the, the, those, the women who trained the same leg, same, same time, same weight, same everything, those first and, back, first and last two weeks, the women who trained in the first two weeks gained 42% more muscle, more strength, isometric force, <laughs> and um, the other study is Reese 1995 and that's like uh, one leg is trained with regular frequency across the whole month and the other leg has a greater frequency just the first two weeks so it's like focusing all the effort and front loading it mm-hmm. and that's 46 percent more more so uh, I mean we'll link to all these studies in the show notes guys but yeah uh, yeah, yeah it's just it's um, interesting the- because it's fascinating. It's so, like that's yeah. massive, but nobody's taking this into consideration. Well, a few people are taking this into consideration. I, I'd like to. I want to say more and more, but it just doesn't. It's like, and some trainers know about this, but I think. I mean, I've worked with male and female trainers my whole life, like here and there, from college on, like personal trainers going to a gym, and nobody, no one ever told me this. So I have to believe that there's just it's still such a small percentage of people talking about it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if I said to you, Boomer, look, these 12 days of the month, you're going to be able to build 44% mu- more muscle and you could only work out for a certain percentage of time. When would you work out? Of course. Right? When would you strength train? You know? I would plan my entire life around those 12 days, but I'm a nut. So that's okay. Now, I guess, are you consistently training throughout these 12 days or is there some sort of rest recovery period in between? I would love to just double click a yeah, little let's, bit let's on talk this. about it yeah yeah let's let's prescribe it a bit the um the way that i i recommend and, and i also do this myself but um the way that i recommend women to do it is because let's be honest the first day second day of the cycle the estrogen is just starting to you know begin its bell curve or start to spike and 
women are typically feeling. Like I always say, you got to go with your intuition. If you mm-hmm. are someone who's experiencing a lot, a lot, a lot of PMS and symptomatic stuff from getting your period, which is not a natural thing, by the way. Like we're not supposed to be wrecked from, um, you know, the PMS and all of that stuff. You know, there there are things that are happening in our body that, of course, can affect us. But um, I think I was talking to you earlier about Elisa Vitti having an amazing book called Flow that talks in deep, deep, if anyone wants to do a deep dive on that, why some of the PMS systems, Jolene Brighton's another great person that, that is talking about this now, but why PMS systems don't, the PMS symptoms don't have to be so intense. Um, mm-hmm. But if you're, if you're, the first couple of days, you might be feeling like women can feel like they want to spend a little more time alone or be a little cocooned, et cetera. It's, it's cool. But I, I'm pretty adamant with people like, look, the best thing you can do for cramps, the best thing you can do for mood is get your stuff up and get going and get some kind of workout on, um, even in those early f- first few days. But by day three, I'm saying girls, women, ladies, get out there and get lifting. Um, I'm, I'm, and I'm a little like you, right? It's like I dive in, I'm at the gym on day three of my period, and I'm like, estrogen, yeah! <laughs> like I'm cheering myself on with that mentality because I think we have to shift the conversation and shift mm-hmm. sort of the way we think about it right and instead of being like oh I'm on my period and it's awful and it sucks it's like I I try to celebrate it and I try to think this is my superpower right now this is 44 I mean I know these studies now right so I'm like this is 44 percent more muscle let's get after it so by day three I'm coaching people to get into the gym and I'm saying two things yes you still have to take a rest day every week if you're going to work out as as much as as when I work with women at warrior woman mode, I'm typically in an eight week one-on-one program. And so I'm pushing them to do some sort of workout six days a week. It doesn't necessarily mean the heaviest strength training in the world. You know, it might be a mobility day, et cetera, but I'm, I always want them to be moving in general seven Mm -hmm. days a week, meaning walking around, getting their steps in. And then the six days a week, I want them to have some kind of 45 minute plus activity. But during those 12 days, during that follicular phase from day three to day 14 of their cycle, I'm punching them in as many strength training workouts as I can get them Mm -hmm. because that's the time we want to, it's like lift heavy things, build more muscle. I think it, it requires one other note, which is you don't have to strength train and get huge as a woman. There's sort of that vibe, right? Where women are like, I don't want to lift weights because I'm going to get huge. And it's just like not the case, right? Unless you're like trying to compete, and get two hours a day in the gym with a barbell and, you know, put up your personal record with one lift and, and dive into that world. You don't have to get huge. I lift really heavy weight compared to what I used to lift. It's like little five and 10, 10 pound dumbbells are, are good for some exercises, but for the most part, I'm putting up heavier weights. And when I am not sheltered at home, I've taught myself and worked with trainers in order to learn how to use a barbell and not be afraid of that. What, what, I lovingly could call the iron jungle in the gym, right? The place where you go where all the guys are like, ah, I'm going to lift stuff. I'm going to wear four weight belts. I'm going to, you know, Mm -hmm. they're doing their thing. And sometimes that's intimidating. Like, let's just be honest. Socially, that's intimidating in some ways. So if you want, if you want to gain the muscle, you have to do the work. And I think it's a distinction that needs to be made between weight loss and fat loss. Mm -hmm. So the other, it's not a secret, but I think women need to know that you don't have to get huge by lifting heavy weight. You, you can get more lean. And that the more muscle you have on your body, the more you're burning calories as you walk around in your day-to-day life, yeah. right? Even when you're sleeping. And so mm-hmm. the goal is not to lose weight, ladies. The goal is not to lose weight. The goal is to lose fat, right? Yeah. If you need to, if that's, if, that's what you're, if that's what you're shooting for. So there's a, a definite distinction. I talk about a lot. I like blow up on my Instagram feed to say it's not about weight loss. I will never take on a client who wants to lose weight. I will only take on a client that's like, I have these five goals. It may just be getting tone and it may be feeling healthy, get more energy. But if they want to lose anything, it's, they, they have to recognize the difference between losing weight and losing fat. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about a lot of compound movements, it sounds like. Is it still, I mean, do you do the donkey kickbacks or are we kind of ditching those for now? Um, I mean, I, so are we talking about sheltering at home? We uh, well, I we guess access to a yeah. gym? But let's, let's go to the future where we have access to a gym. So I think 
this is the other thing, right? Is that we, I don't know where this has come from. If you have any insight, I would love to know. But we, it's some, there's something about, we can be sexy and strong and graceful and delicate and all of these things. And I, but I, I think there's something from socialization over the years that walking in and picking up heavy weights or pulling on a machine, it just feels like we're not, I was never really taught how to do that. If I didn't advocate for myself and go out and seek that, then I wouldn't have learned. And here's an interesting thing that happens all the time. Uh, it's like men will go in. This is, I think this is how guys invest money. I think, this, and I'm not like, look, I'm not sexist and I'm not super pro women, but it's like, I ha I've seen this time and time again. Somebody will go to invest some funds. It happens to be a man. The man is like, never really invested before and he talks to his buddy and he's like yo i'm gonna shoot from the hip i put money in there and boomer did that <laughs> boomer did that i put some money in it and women are like okay i need to think about this i need to be prescriptive i need to research i'm not sure i don't know if i should do that we just we ha we're, we're like more risk averse or something and, and and rightly so maybe because we're bearing the children maybe because we're trying to keep the household together you know like i'm talking about back in the day right now we all do all the things but um, there's some sensibility from a biological female standpoint that makes us walk into the gym in that way. I put a bar up, guaranteed. I put a bar up next to you. We're both in the gym. I'm loading weights. You're loading weights. Somebody says put on the most weight you can lift. You're going to put on a little bit more weight than you actually can lift. And I'm going to put on a little less weight than I can actually lift. Like Interesting. you're just going to, I see that a lot in the gym. Um, and then also I, I try to get the women I work with too to, to and these are like broader topics. We could talk about the exercise too, but I also try to get women to have some personal responsibility in the gym. Mm -hmm. I will see someone work out with a trainer or work out um, in the gym and, and a, a guy will be like, oh, I, put, I did all this work and he'll come back the next day or two days later and say, I really pushed myself too hard. Like I kind of hurt my shoulder. I got to watch it today. Yeah. And a woman will come back and, and say to an instructor or a class or something, Oh, you gave me too much weight to do. I hurt myself. Like there's a, there's a personal responsibility around lifting heavy weights. So we always have to be careful of bio, biomechanical form, yeah. but what an interesting distinction, right? And so it's like how, what I, when I work with women, what I'm trying to say to them and coach them to do is to be able to, to have all the knowledge and be careful and be safe, but also be a bit brave, be a bit daring, try to recognize that if you're going to lift that 10 pound weight over and over and over again, you're never going to get anywhere. You have to try to challenge yourself to failure because it's, it's the tip of the iceberg of success. It's mm -hmm. like failure will, will, will teach you how to do something better, right? It's like, how do you fail faster? I, it's the same thing with weight. Mm -hmm. So if women have access to the gym, they need to be getting, and let's talk about longevity. If you're not lifting weights, it affects your bone density and, and everything. You have to be lifting heavy weights. Yeah. So, might as well be starting when you hear this podcast <laughs> to get out yeah. there and, and get it done. It's amazing because like, I know this from working with, for instance, my mother who had osteopenia, borderline osteoporosis. And it was just as simple as weightlifting was the kind of um, Archimedes lever, if you will, that got her off the drugs, off that path. And now she's, she's fine. She's got great bone strength, but it's yeah. so, so important when it comes to longevity. Now we've covered days one through 14 here. There's still a little bit more of the cycle to do. What do you do in the back half of this? It sounds yeah, like great, you're, great beast, you're beast, like in the beginning, <laughs> you go in the weight room, you pick up weight, you convince me that, you know, I should, be smarter about the weight that I choose on the barbell, et cetera. But what should I be doing in the back half? Yeah, the back half is a, is a different distinction for sure. So um, it is about lifting heavy weight. And I would just also say in that front half of the cycle, that body weight exercise, I'm learning very quickly and even more so I think, oh, this is not going to be enough. Body weight exercises? That is not true. You can do body weight exercise. Like I'm, you know, I'm 150 pounds. I am, if I have to lift myself, handstands, whatever, it's some work. So you yeah. find ways to do push-ups and burpees and all that that can actually maintain the muscle you have at the very least and probably for women even build muscle if you're not doing a ton. So let's compare the first two weeks to the last two weeks, follicular stage versus the luteal phase. The follicular phase is when we have that estrogen spike and I say, go as hard as you can, as often as you can, 
lift more heavy weights during that segment of your cycle and really focus on strength training and if you're doing hit training or something but things that are harder for you and that things that you can actually when I say fail I mean you're going to max reps and then you're like okay I need a breather because this has been a lot Mm -hmm. um the back half of the cycle it doesn't mean you shouldn't be strength training I think you have to at least strength train once during the course of those weeks a week I still try to have women do a couple days of strength training but this is an opportunity for them to also vary up the fitness right to do things that they I mean they may love strength training but just to find other things that they love because across the board we are better creatures when we work in sort of the four or five pillars right it's like you need to have a mobility practice so that might be like a kin stretch or a yoga or a Pilates or something that's just sort of lengthening and stretching you in a way that feels great for your functional mobility. Uh, mm-hmm. There's so much stuff out there, functional range conditioning. And I, I love kin stretch. If you can get your hands on any of the videos or go to a class and then yoga is an, is pretty, is, is an easy one, right? So mobility, really important. You have your strength. We already talked about. And then it's like, what are the other things you can do for cardiovascular health? So I definitely want people to be doing cardio conditioning. So spin class or I'm not a, a super keen, I'm not super keen on running because I think like with joints and stuff, it can be challenging. But if you love to run and you're a runner, then running can be cardiovascular fitness for you. Mm-hmm. Hit gives you some of that as well. So getting some of that kind of conditioning in is really important. Um, I think that there needs to be breath work all the time, but it's a, a, an opportunity on the back half to concentrate and focus a bit more on your breath work practice so let's talk about breath work well, i'm gonna interrupt yeah, yeah. Here because it, i know it, you've it. been going down the wormhole on breath work lately um yeah. basic prescription if you will for people to focus on when it comes to breath work I, I just would love to hear this kind of we're going through a stressful time right if you're going to give yeah. advice to women men etc resilient uh, Building resilience through breathing. Is there any particular protocols that you like? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I mean, the first and foremost thing that is important with breathing, everybody can up level their fitness game from day one right now is just trying to pay attention every single part of your day to breathing in and out through your nose only. Mm-hmm. So, of course, we're going to talk and interact with people, or maybe you're like me and you're not living with anyone right now. It's an opportunity to think about closing your mouth and breathing in and out nasally because there's a lot of function that's happening with nitric oxide production and filtering the air and temping, like just creating the right temperature of the air as it gets into your lungs. And during this time where we have this like virus going on and floating around in germs and stuff, even if you're outside, it's important to keep your mouth closed because this is, especially with COVID, it's like transferred right through fluids and things. And so how do we get that filtration or any shot at potentially filtering the air so that we're not taking in that the bad stuff is nasal breathing. So that's the number one prescription for everyone is like, figure out how often you nose breathe and try to up that because it's, it's also the way that we get more oxygen into the blood. Because if you breathe through your nose, the base of the lungs gets filled and gets more air and that's where lots of the blood is because you're standing upright in the world, right? So based on gravity, you mm-hmm. have uh, all the blood in the bottom lobes of your lungs. And so when you breathe in your nose, you can get a deeper breath, expand that and oxygenate the, the blood better. Uh, so, so that's the number one thing. But then, then there's two things that I've been telling people, which I made, I made two 10 minute breath work things that are on my Instagram at warrior woman mode that are free that you can go and listen to. And one of them is called riding the wave. And it's a super chill when you're stressed, when you have anxiety, when you're trying to go to sleep at night and you're having a tough time. It's a lot of inhaling on a four or six count and then doubling your exhale, all nasal breathing. So it's just like long, slow, deep breathing through your nose and then exhaling twice as long or as long as you can. Even for some people like exhaling through a straw makes people kind of activate the vagus nerve and makes people feel calmer. Mm -hmm. And then the other one I have is called Rise and Shine. Because what I heard that start a lot of what's going on right now with people or women in my fitness group is they're having a tough time kind of getting up in the morning. That they're feeling like low or depressed or they're feeling like not ready to do their workout because they're not in community anymore. They're in their homes mm-hmm. and they're doing their workout alone. And so that one has a lot of super ventilation. Mm-hmm. So you're doing lots of it. It feels a little whim hoppy, if you will. <laughs> so there's some super ventilation, which is like helping you kind of 
awaken the brain, awaken the mind, flush the air through, you get some tingling, you start, you do a little floating, you hold, do some breath holds. So th those kinds of things, I think, waken you up, prep you pre-workout or if you're heading out into your day. That was beautiful. And sorry to interrupt there, but we were talking about the back half of the yeah. cycle, right? And so we've, yep. and there's so many things I want to jump into you with, but we've talked about cardiovascular work, mobility work, we've talked about breath work and all the importance of that, as well as lifting a couple of times there. Anything else we should add? Because I really want to dive into nutrition with you too. Um, I just think the cool thing is when you put all the pieces together, we'll, we'll talk about nutrition and it'll be sort of like the third piece of the puzzle. But when you have this like strength train, work out hard, we're going to talk about you can get more carbs in the front, front half of your cycle. And then in the back half of your cycle, you're still working out. Like people will say to me jokingly, if I'm speaking at a, on a panel or something, a woman will be like, okay, so can I just work out for those 12 days and like sit on the couch and eat ice cream yeah, exactly, the rest of the right? time? And the answer, of course, is no, because then you're counteracting everything you do. But here's the, the cool thing to me is that we'll talk about food and how it correlates strength training in those those about 12 days or so after the first couple of days of your period big heavy hard back half of your cycle vary up the fitness making sure you're getting mobility and everything else in there and then really now this, there are studies there are few so it's not 110 percent clear but what it looks like with women based on the different levels of hormones that we have in our cycle and this comes like straight from like patrick mccowan from oxygen advantage sending me studies that are challenging for me to read and I'm learning every day but it looks like women have 25% less capability in the back half of their cycle to uptake oxygen so that means if we have less of an opportunity to uptake oxygen they're learning this a lot from these like crazy TMJ studies so we got yeah. a ways to go but hey we got studies on women so if that is true that means that the prescription are talking about this protocol of like first couple weeks of your cycle go hard back half don't go as hard makes sense right i can't get as much oxygen that at that point anyway so you're doing some more breathing i should be practicing working on holding my breath in some ways they're just how i can get more co2 tolerance more capability to breathe light slow deep through my nose mm -hmm. so cool love that and then also um and so those two things correlate. And that's also like a really nice, nice way to segue into nutrition because we also have some nutritional differences Absolutely. across the board. Yeah. Let's, let's dive into nutrition because one of the things you and I have talked about quite a bit is sort of that idea of, I don't want to call it carb loading, but glycogen uptake in that first half. Take us yeah. through, I mean, we don't have to go through the back chemistry of it, but like if you're going to plan this out, is there a way, like, should I be carb cycling? Should I be eating more carbs in the front half, latter half? How would you do it? So if you are a biological female, you should, you, your muscles have the capability to uptake uh, glycogen more mm -hmm. in the first half of your cycle. Mm -hmm. Which means you can have, you can increase the carbs that you're eating. Now, when I say increase the carbs, you know, I always want to talk and remind people that carbohydrates, you want high performance, food is fuel, carbohydrates. So it's like rice, sweet potato, quinoa, things like that. It's not, it's not cookies or candy. <laughs> so, you know. so, so the chips away shouldn't come out in the first chips half. Chips away. Oh my God. I love that reference. Yeah. Yeah. So not chips away, but um, you have the capability to have more carbs. So if you're trying to do, you know, and I, I know a year ago I was like staunchly like, oh, game on ketogenic game on. This is my dream. Yeah. I'm just going to do this. And I, the more that I've read and researched now, I clearly do not recommend number one i never thought women should do more keto more than 60 days in a row because yes. it messes with our hormones etc mm -hmm. but if we're talking about health optimization that which is all i want to coach women to have is to be optimally well then you have the capability to uptake more carbs which guess what your muscles love carbohydrates so in the first two weeks when you have the capability for more glycogen uptake you can strength train your your butt off and literally <laughs> and mm -hmm. Take those carbs to fuel your muscles. So it's just it it's it's the magic of the human body and physiology that we have that, and like what a superpower that that's all going on at once, right? Strength train hard, take some more carbs in, feed those muscles, get some more oxygen than you can, and then the back half of the cycle you're taking it down a notch, you're leaning down the carbs a bit, and then you're doing a different style, styles of workout. 
Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that to me is like, that's how I try to have women fluctuate and move throughout the cycle. Some, you know, what, ketogenic what, is on fire right now too. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, like, some people like, you don't want to dive in from eating chips, ahoy lifestyle to ketogenic either, you know, but well, there the, are benefits. People will crash when they do that. But like yeah. when you, when you go from first half to, to second half, um, for lack of a better term, um, <clears throat> switching to a fully ketogenic lifestyle, is that something that could be recommended here or is keto sort of one of those things that may be best left to somebody else? I, I And I know I we're never, all biologically individual, by the way, so. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I, I will never take and, you know, we're talking about women mainly today, but I will never, and that's my the heavy part of my client base, although I'm happy to train men. Um, the, I will never take a woman from the standard American diet or a woman who's um, quite obese into straight into a, a ketogenic diet. It's yeah. too much of a, it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy Night and day, right? Yeah. But let's say you're, to, they're, they're your client and they're kind of running with what your, your protocols, right? Um, mm-hmm. would you potentially use ketosis in any sort of fashion in that back half of the month? Um, or yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. I would definitely, if they're familiar and they, you know, I also think you, you know, you, you know, a client, a person has to, women come, women will come to me because ketogenic is such a hot word and a triggered trigger lifestyle right now. They'll say, Hey, I want to do keto. Teach me how to do keto. Like, I, I'm not even sure they always know what it is, mm-hmm. but they I'm a do. firm believer that, that they want to do it, right? Because if you have to design, uh, uh, or I design, but I think as a nutritionist, a good nutritionist, you have to design a program that meets the client where they're at and something yeah. that they're willing to adhere to. Because yeah. if I tell you, you can only have four spoonfuls of peas every single day of the month, you're not going to adhere to it, right? It's not going to work. So people have to be interested enough in ketogenic lifestyle and be willing to sort of to go there. And I can, I can explain to them sometimes if they're on the fence. And if they're not, then I just have them on a leaner carbohydrate type of diet, the back half. Mm-hmm. So getting them to keto, the recommendation, instead of doing like a month or two on of keto and then off, I would recommend that you're doing like a paleo or a slightly higher carb diet in the first two weeks of the month and then pumping those carbs down. And that may mean like, you know, you have to make a distinctive shift that works for you. So the carbs go down to paleo or they go down to keto. Mm-hmm. I love ketogenic diet because I think it helps mimic some of the benefits you get from fasting. And as women, we just can't fast as long as men. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's talk about fasting. Um, what are the particular constraints there in terms of, like, is it, you shouldn't do more than 16, 18 hours or three days fast sort of a bad idea? And if so, we'd love to hear why. Yeah, I think that's a it, it's, Fasting is like the other, it's the other um, really trendy thing, right? Everything exactly. It's about, right I mean, you're, you're in LA, so everything we're talking about right now is pretty trendy. It's happening. But like, uh, you know, keto, even here, my neurofeedback practitioner was like, I'm, on, and she's not the healthiest person in the world. She's a lovely lady. Um, but she's like, I'm following a keto diet. And there's like, and she's like, why? You know, or I'm fasting today. Well, why? And I would love to just get a little bit more educated around from a, a women's perspective, like how do you, how should you look at fasting? Yeah. Um, I think it, fasting is a really, the, the, the challenge here is hormonal profile because yeah. we're an anomaly every single day um, for better, for worse in so many good ways and so many challenging ways. So every single day our hormone pro- profile is slightly different. And because of that, and in a way that's very different than men, right? You might have fluctuations, but they're never going to be as, as wide and diverse as, as mine. And so when we're fasting, the challenge is it will, it will mess with your hormone profile, right? And we, we just, you want to try to keep your hormones as balanced as possible as a woman so that you can get everything optimized, especially the state of mind that you're in, the way that you're working, you know, what your, what your powers are based on the specific part of your cycle that you're in. And so from a fasting perspective, I'm very conservative. Now, I think, um, you know, one meal a day is also really hot here and I'm not so hot for one meal a day. I think it's, I think it's actually just better. Men can handle it better than women. Mm -hmm. Um, In my experience, what I'm seeing from myself, um, 
Tim Tim Lund might 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 have some great advice on what he thinks. And I think um, what I see with my women I'm working with is I, I more or less give them about a 12 hour window. Mm-hmm. So women that are wanting to fast, you know, it's like, you know, and this also aligns with like, when does the sunset, when does the sun rise for you? I think it's important to eat with the light for our circadian rhythm. So mm-hmm. if we're talking about fasting, I say 12 hours. And for some people that means 12 hours and they get up and they're just having like a bulletproof coffee, which does break the fast, right? Cause there's fat in there. Um, and it's debatable. Some people say it doesn't make the fast, but sort of it does. So, um, but so I, I kind of will like allow that if it's a client, right. And I'm, I'm giving them some guidelines, but 12 hours, look, does it mean 14 hours is going to kill you? No, but it's just the longer you go beyond that, if you're getting to that 15 to 18 hour window, it's affecting your hormones. And you, then your body has to do all this work to kind of re-regulate. And I think that that's not worth it. The other thing you can do is scaling um, so that you are, are fasting for, maybe you're fasting for 14 hours, but you're doing that over the three different days of the week, or you're fasting a little bit longer of a window for three days, and then you're having normal eating windows, mm-hmm. you know, your normal eating window, and then you're just sleeping at night, getting up, having breakfast on the other days of the week. And that gives your body a chance to adjust. Because here's the thing, anything... For men, for women, for anyone, if we go from point A to point Z in two minutes, it's too fast, too much. And so how do you scale yourself into the capability to have a more, more often to be able to fast? Awesome. Um, I also think that, that there are women that can do, if they're, you need to be comfortable and have some practice around it. But I think that there's the feasibility to say, look, I'm going to take a day or two a month and I'm going to do a water fast. That means like I'm not eating for that. 24 to 48 hours and it gives your body a chance to rest and actually say wow I don't have to do all the work for this digestion function Mm -hmm. I can go into the rest of my systems and look through there and look at the cells and see what do I need to kill off and what do I need to to you know replicate and what's working and what's not what do I need to do detox and so that's a great option for people who are wanting or willing to do something like that but I'm not going to fast you know, intermittent fast the day before the day after, I'm going to have two normal eating days around that. So that I can like break the fast carefully. Mm -hmm. Um, I I typically will do that for only like once a quarter, right? It's like spring cleaning. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Um, One thing you are quite fond of and I'm jealous because you just had a very long conversation about this ice plunges and just how to strategically use those because look um i I enjoy jumping into we have a beach not too far from our house and during the winter it's quite fun to jump in you also get the neighbors looking at you a little bit weird but um strategically using ice plunges uh, can we walk through a little bit the why behind the buy before we dive into specifically like uh, protocols for that yeah, the why you want to know why? Why we ice plunge? Yeah, why? Why do you do? Why do I see crazy pictures of you, or why do you send me crazy pictures of you doing ice plunges in random places in the world, like Finland in the winter, for instance? Yeah, that was so amazing. Um, <clears throat> I, if you had asked me five years ago if I liked the cold, I don't. I think I would have said, well, I like when it snows and you can have a hot cocoa inside, or you know, I'm learning how to snowboard or something like that. But I, the one thing I, I, I really disliked my whole life was like the moments, unless you're like outside at a beach in Mexico or something, was like the cold shower. Yeah. I just was like, this is like death. Like it is the worst thing to have cold water, not just cold water, like sitting in a tub of cold water, but like shower cold water hitting your skin. Mm-hmm. And so if you had asked me five years ago and or said to me, you're going to be doing 34 days of ice plunges in a row for this challenge. You're going to be like running around like a crazy woman in, in Finland, jumping into a, a frozen river that's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, or probably less actually, right? I think, so, it, I think it was 30. I think it was less because some of it was frozen, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So, so how, you know, how, how do you tackle that, right? Like, how do you, how do you make that jump in, in the course of, it's been like a little bit over a year now. I went and I got XPT certified and um, to be able to coach people in and out of the ice too, right? Because that was like, I don't know if it's on my list, but it very quickly became part of my list as soon as I saw it. Like instantaneously, for some reason, I was just drawn to 
this is the type of ice people are getting in to adapt their bodies. And, and when we talk about that, everything else we're doing when you're eating cleaner and when you're going to the gym and you're doing micro tearing your muscles in order for them to recover and rebuild, all of that is about I'm creating a certain level of stress, the minimum effective dose in order to create the next level of optimal state for myself. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing that with weight. I'm doing that with food. I'm doing that with fasting. Why wouldn't I do that and create an adaptation in a passive way and sit in the ice? Right. So I think that the ice plunge is um, it's a practice that I want to get everybody to try and do yeah. the it feels like the anticipation of the ice bath is worse than the ice bath itself. That's, I the, think real, so too. that's the real yeah. story. The, the benefits of and I also like, look, I've done cryo. I'm down for cold showers. All that stuff is helpful. Right. A lot of it is helpful for that short term recovery, short term benefits. Now, at the cryo, people would probably tell me nine other things, but I prefer being soaking, like putting my body up to my neck or sometimes submerging my head into the ice water that is 40 degrees or less. And that is because the long-term benefits outshine by far in all the science, outshine the other short-term benefits of cryo and cold showers. Now, we're, you know, we're sheltered at home. You can't easily run out and get ice and do all the things. Our cold shower is good. Yeah, awesome. If you, nobody's a cryo chamber in their house, if they do, awesome. But it's like the ice tub is like nothing else. And the, it's about brown fat versus it's, your adipose is two different types of fat. It's about building brown fat and killing, like getting less white fat. I talked, I had that, I had a long podcast myself yesterday talking to people who run that, the ice tub company and really talking about let's talk about a women's perspective. I spoke to a woman who runs this company and she's a co-founder and she has been through tons. She was diagnosed with three terrible autoimmune disorders, one of which is Hashimoto's, which is, I don't know if you're seeing this, but I'm seeing it quite diagnosis of that on the rise along with PCOS. It's like by no in, means in general, like Hashi's as well as Graves, it's like thyroid related conditions are, are Correct. quite significant, right? So, yeah, for sure, for sure. And by no no means am I saying like don't listen to your doctor, go off your meds, whatever, but I think that this is a highly the way to treat the symptoms and potentially because the benefits of ice bath are anti-inflammatory everything. When you get in that water, you are drawing down the inflammation in your body in so many ways. You are giving yourself um a dopamine dump, like you're giving yourself brain chemical dump that is just exhilarating as you can imagine people stand at the side of the ice tub and they will look at me just beautifully their first experience and they'll look at me and they'll be like it's cold right and I want to say it's cold don't procrastinate anymore just go you know just jump um, in yeah just jump in but the benefit the benefits the, the biological benefits the physical benefits are are massive right and it's about longevity it's about cellular health it's about all the heavy benefits of the autoimmune, you know, treating autoimmune is, are around anti-inflammatory, the anti-inflammatory properties of getting in an ice bath and what it does to us. And there, the one, the big benefit I really think as well from an ice bath perspective is you get in and you build this thing that's like mental toughness. Yeah. The the resilience benefit is something that I think is very hard to replicate in a cryo chamber right? Like you can't. So. Yeah. And also like I'll see, you see people in like little videos or on social or whatever, like dancing around the cryo chamber. And it's like, you're every, mo- every movement that you make is defeating the purpose. Yeah. So I get it. They're trying to warm up, but the point is you don't want to be warm in those three minutes. You want to create a stressor for your body at whatever time frame that you can manage. And you want to have your body shift under the stressor so that it actually adapts to the cold and and gives you the the biological benefit of being in the ice but the 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 other piece that's really fascinating is like when you combo it with the right breath work and you get in and it's like if you can't get get someone to coach you through the ice of course like dm me i'll tell you all the things but get a buddy go to, to to do some kind of an ice plunge right and then you get in the ice and the reality is your body within the first 30 to 60 seconds has a switch and 
you get in and it's cold, right? It's going to be sub 40 degrees and you're going to feel, okay, like this is freezing. I need to figure out how to handle this. Your initial body response, your body doesn't know about like longevity. Your body's like, I just need to live for the next 24 hours so I can do one of the Fs, right? I can feed or I can fornicate or I can, you know, whatever I need to do. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just trying to get you to live in that moment. It's not thinking about, oh, I want to have this like long, energetic, healthy life. It's just trying to get you to live. So you get in and your first body, your nervous system response is sympathetic. You're like, oh my goodness, what's happening to me? Your body tells your brain to get out of the ice and all of that. But if you sit calmly and you breathe through it and you try to activate your parasympathetic nervous system by nasal breathing, you sit in the ice up to your neck. And then within 30 to 60 seconds, your body will literally switch off. Let's just call it the panic button. And you will be so in the now and so in the moment and be able to do that two to three minutes in the ice bath and just feel like, cold but manageable mm -hmm. and then you can calmly get out of the ice and you're going to have a parasympathetic rebound you're going to get really silly you're going to feel really happy you're going to have a flush of energy all of that but when you're out and you've completed that first round for your very first time or your hundredth time every single time you're in the ice you're building this like mental toughness because what I've learned from the ice more than anything else is like as it goes in the ice it goes in life when and why I quit or want to get out or jump or the thoughts that I have about myself, I can't do this, all of that, are the same things I have when I have a big meeting with, you, you have a meeting with your boss or you're in traffic or you're in a fight with your partner or something, your default zone is the same. And yeah. so how do I get stronger mentally, tougher mentally, so that I can actually manage stress? Something coming at me that's unexpected and it's like, yo, I sat in a tub of ice I was in a river in Finland for six minutes. I didn't know when I got out. My shiver response was so intense. And when I got out, I was like, wow, I cannot believe this. And, you know, part of me was like, I'm a little competitive. was like, oh, there's 20 Finnish guys that are like, we do this all the time. And I was like, I'm going to be the last one in the water. I'm going to show them, like, we're all going to jump in naked. And I'm going to be the last one in the water, right? And it's just, if I hadn't been doing ice plunging for a long time, I would have never managed that. I would yeah. have never been able to handle that. But you get out and you're like, okay, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. And then you can't stop. And mm -hmm. I think that that's like, there is joy in it, right? It's like starts to, to switch over. I don't know if you've experienced this, but it's like, now I, I had that call yesterday to talk about that ice bath company. And I was like, now it's like harder to not be you getting in the ice it, right? than it is to get in the ice. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, damn it, it's getting warm outside. I, like, I love the fact that the sun's out until late, but I'm like, damn it, it's getting warm outside. That means I can't just go dive into the river anymore. I know um, you're so lucky to have that there. So you don't have to schlep three, three I schlep like 100 pounds of ice up three flights of stairs to get it in. That's that actually, stuff. I mean, in plans for the future, right? I told you that the man cave is almost complete in here and, you know, I just yeah. need to figure out how to position the ice bath. But, uh, Chris, Kristen, this has been such an amazing conversation. Now, I want to take us to final three questions or I'm going to take us there. Um, Great. What is the book that has the most impact or has had the most impact on your life? I mean, I want to say that uh, it's like the first, the, there are two. Am I allowed to say two or you just want one? No, go for two. I'm on, <laughs> the first I'm, one I'm on, I'm on pedantic. <laughs> it's like only one. Uh, I read two books almost simultaneously and they're the ones that really got me going on like the food, the, the oh, this is the right journey for me. Oh my goodness. Um, one of them is Clean by uh, Younger, Dr. Younger, J-U-N-G-E-R. Mm -hmm. And that was the first one to say to me, hey, like, do some foods in the blender and have one meal a day that's whole and don't eat processed foods at all and clean this out. It was sort of like the precursor to paleo. Yeah. And then I, I simultaneously read that book and um, the, the Primal Challenge, which was what Mark Sisson, one of his first books. Mm -hmm. And those two books coupled together were game changing for me in a way that was uh, clean had been out, I'm sure, but, uh, but, but. Mark's book had just come out or Mark's challenge had just come out. Right? And it was like about the primal advantage, the primal challenge where how you do 21 days. And both of them were saying, do these protocols and then call me and tell me they don't like younger's book, especially was like, you wanted me to take, you want to go 
call me and tell me you want to take me to dinner and that this book doesn't work, this program doesn't work at all. But in order for you to do that, you have to do the program, then tell me. And I just thought for some reason that the simplicity in that resonated. So mm -hmm. then I did, I did what was in his book and I thought, oh my goodness, I've never had levels of energy. My brain was clear. That was the first time brain fog cleared for me. And so, yeah, so was the book. What's your top trick for enhancing focus? Um, well, right now it's breath, but the reality is that nootropic, all the nootropic stuff that's coming out from Blue <laughs> Do you have a favorite one? To, yeah, Blue uh, Canopy, and let's just call it. So nice. I don't want to talk about microdosing psilocybin in a state where it's illegal, but otherwise, uh, you, can, you can freely <laughs> talk about it. There's been many people that have. So, um, yeah. So we can talk about stem and stacks later. Um, but that's a that's a fun <laughs> one. Excellent. So, uh, last question is: What excites you most about the health world right now? What excites me most about the health world right now? Uh, the answer is breath, because during this time of crisis, it's so nice to see this like this meteoric rise of people talking about how they can breathe, how they can take care of themselves, how they can energize themselves through the breath. And mm -hmm. what it really comes down to is the entire world getting more in touch. Like if the if breath is the remote control for your nervous system, then the entire world is starting to get, even if it's 1% more in touch with how we control our nervous systems. And I think that that the global up-leveling from that alone will help us all make decisions, treat each other better, keep an eye on what we're doing for the world, how we take care of other people, and just how we take care of ourselves, our mental well-being, our sex lives, everything. Because when you regulate your nervous system, you regulate everything. Amazing. Kristen, where can people find out more about you? I have a, a website, warriorwomanmode.com. Instagram is all the fun antics and little videos of me getting in the ice and stuff. So that's that warrior woman mode. And then mm -hmm. by the time this airs, the podcast will be out. So oh. Well Power Podcast. Um, and you, you're going to have to listen to Boomer's episode because it's quite informative. <laughs> I hope I sound intelligent. But this has been amazing. Look, uh, we, were, we could have gone on forever. But Kristen, thank you so much for taking the time today to educate me and educate everybody else about all these wonderful things. I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you too. Super stoked to be here and share, uh, share how to make women into warriors. Excellent. To all the superhumans listening out there, have an absolutely epic day.